So I, I really wanted to do a video about my impressions, what I took away from Guild Wars 2 as far as its story went, as far as its universe went, um, as far as just how the plot moved forward and how the personal story really did, how it held up, um, just my general impressions. Now this isn't like a really heavy, oh this is, we're going to speculate about all the lore, we're going to look at all the really cool stuff that came out and see what the expansions could do. Necessarily, I, I mean I don't even think I know everything yet, I'd ha probably have to play every single character of all the personal stories to know exactly everything that's been introduced with Guild Wars 2 and all the threads and plots but just in general my critique if you will I, I almost hesitate to say that though my review or, or how I felt about the personal story of Guild Wars 2 because I wanted to get my thoughts out there I have obviously put, spent a lot of time here on YouTube talking about the story I am very heavily invested in the universe that Guild Wars 1 gave us and now Guild Wars 2 has expanded on I just really wanted to let you guys know what I took from it and whether I was disappointed in the story which I was in places I was disappointed um, but also what I think that it did well and where I hope ArenaNet will go forward with the story because I do feel like, and I've known about some of these things before I even got in game, I do feel like some of the stuff they tried to do fell short and I just really wanted to talk about that kind of stuff. So. Uh, obviously there will be spoilers ahead, I am going to be talking about some of the bigger stuff that happened in the plot, so if you haven't completed the game yet, uh, maybe you'll want to turn this off, if you want to experience certain other storylines that you might not know about, again you might want to turn it off, but I'm not going to go out of my way to spoil all of the big stuff, so... Don't, don't feel like this is just going to ruin absolutely everything for you, because it probably won't. But my, my general opinion, I would just say straight away, first off, is that Guild Wars 2 is very similar to Guild Wars 1 in that the developers have created a really compelling, rich, interesting universe. The setting, the world of Tyria and the mist and everything that comes with it is really well done. They've got this big chessboard and they've put all the right pieces in all the right areas to have made something that really could be very compelling and cool. And it's, it's great to think about all of the stories and things that could come out of the universe. And theory crafting for the universe is, is really fun and that still remains the same. They haven't ruined the universe, they haven't cut any of the major players out of it, they've just added interesting twists and turns in a lot of cool places, given us nice little bits of information about certain things like the gods, like what what the Norn have runes are doing, like the rage of Coda that's going on with the Kodan. All these things have just been expanded upon with Guild Wars 2, and really the universe remains the same as a very compelling, interesting place. And even if you look back at the introduction of the main races and their prevalence and all the interesting facets of their cultures and stuff, it all remains very strong to me. I feel like Ree and Jeff have done very, very well at creating a really cool setting, and I love that, and that's what I loved about Guild Wars 1. But at the same time, just as with Guild Wars 1, I would unfortunately say that I, I think Guild Wars 2, even though it's got this fantastic setting, the actual story that they're giving us in this setting falls short. And I, I feel like that's a big problem and, and, and a disappointing thing because with a lot of new players that are being introduced to this universe, for someone like me that already knows quite a lot about it, I can say, oh yeah, it's really good, and I can talk about these stories and cool things that are going on with it, but for a new player that's not already invested in the universe, they need to be presented with a story in their face that does get them invested in something. I feel like you need a good, compelling, immediate story. You need characters that you can relate to. You need interesting situations to make people interested in the universe in the first place. It's not normal behavior, I think, for for us to be given a game or a book or a film or anything with really flat horrible characters and I'm not necessarily saying Guild Wars 2's got that but it's not normal to be presented with that situation and then still be able to look past that and say oh actually but the setting they've really given us is still really interesting. I think a lot of the time a new player will probably come into Guild Wars 2 and if they don't get grabbed by the story or the characters immediately they're going to quickly fall into this horrible situation that we had with Guild Wars 1 where people just think there's no sustenance there at all and they just hit skip the cutscene, skip the cutscene, skip all of the dialogue and just move forward from there, which I feel like, unfortunately, just as it happened with Guild Wars 1, it's probably happened with Guild Wars 2 as well. One of the big things I feel like that, that's been unfortunate for Guild Wars 2 is... It's actually a really good story when you compare it to other MMOs, okay? Massively multiplayer online games are not known for their stories. They, they simply are not. Recently, we've seen it come forward a tiny bit more. But when people get into MMOs, they do not think that the story is going to be very good, which obviously is farcical considering they're supposed to be role-playing games, MMORPGs a lot of the time. That was one of the big pushes I think ArenaNet were trying to make. They were trying to, as they were saying, put the RPG back into the MMO. And to an extent, I feel like they did that. When you look at Guild Wars compared to other MMOs out there on the market right now, it's doing amazing. It is a very, very good story. 
I feel like it's to pilfer a term in a bit of an uncanny valley at the moment where people get in and they realise that there's some reasonable production value here, there's a lot of voice acting, there's a lot of things that you see in single player games and then they start to think they are playing a single player game and they start to levy critiques against Guild Wars 2 that maybe aren't entirely justified because they're looking at it as oh, well, this isn't as good as Mass Effect, this isn't as good as what this Final Fantasy did, this isn't as good as what these single-player games that are in a genre that's had decades and decades to refine their storytelling, this isn't as good as what they have to offer. Which I feel like is maybe a little bit unwarranted for Guild Wars 2. I have been seeing a lot of that. A lot of people saying, oh, the personal story is rubbish just because it doesn't compare to these experiences you can get in other single-player games. I don't necessarily think there's anything wrong with asking for an MMO that offers that kind of experience, but I do think it's wrong to expect it because these things do take time to develop and I think you would have been fooled to expect Guild Wars 2 to have released and to have made you been able to cry or really, really care about characters as you might have in other single player genres. I think that that would have been a bit of a misstep and it's unfortunate really that a lot of people I think will have gone into Guild Wars 2 and actually seen, because a lot is similar to what we get in single player games, people do lose their grounding. They see that Guild Wars 2's actually made a fair few pushes and now it's in a weird middle ground where it's not being judged as an MMO for its story, it's being judged, it's the underdog in the next pool up and, and that's a bit of a shame. I have tried myself to keep myself reasonably grounded it's very easy to want to have this really stellar cinematic experience for the game and I would have loved to have seen that but I am trying to be slightly more moderate with my approach considering what we're actually dealing with here we're dealing with an MMO that the entire entire focus of this thing's development did not go onto the personal story. It is a big game with a lot of other stuff going on with it and the fairest way to judge it is by judging it alongside other similar things rather than single player games. But in any case, I, I do have quite a few criticisms so I'm not defending it fully. Uh, before I get into those, I, I should probably just quickly let you know what I really did like. As I said, I do think that Guild Wars 2 was better at giving its story than Guild Wars 1 was. It's still in the same camp that it's still poorly delivered and it doesn't do justice to the universe. It really doesn't. You can have a fantastic universe but if you're messing up the story itself or you're really not involving or engaging the, the audience with the stories you're delivering in that universe, it doesn't doesn't matter. I think they still have that problem with Guild Wars 2 as they did with Guild Wars 1, but the second game does feel far better and far more rewarding. The first game, all of this plot stuff just felt like it was getting in the way. Uh, particularly after Prophecies, you felt like you would just have to go through it so you could explore and do the stuff you really wanted to. For Guild Wars 2, they've kept that separate, which I think was a good move, even though people are still kind of just rushing through it and skipping the cutscenes when if they're not interested in the story, they could just not do it at all. But still, I think that that was a good move for them to have done. Uh, the voice acting, they they talked a lot about this as before the game came out. I feel like a lot of the voice acting is wasted on conversations that happen with NPCs just around the world that 99% of people aren't going to listen to or are simply not going to see because the game isn't encouraging them to go to all those back corners of the Ossin Quarter in Divinity's Reach, for example, and they're not going to see all of the, the information that's there about Alona and so forth. I feel like a lot of the money that went, or a lot of the effort that went on the voice acting could have been far better spent on the personal story itself, making it longer, making it more engaging, giving us more time with certain topics which I'll get into later um, but the voice acting in general it has made leaps and bounds it's far better than the traditional oh look we have a big block of text that it's so easy to just hit accept and ignore and never have to read it is far better and I do feel like a lot more people will have been paying attention to the story now just because of the voice acting there might be more criticisms and more talk about the personal story now uh, but I think that's because it's much easier for people to follow now which is a definite plus I think that's probably the biggest plus that they put I also I, I also feel like there's other small things that they got right. I enjoy now that our character actually has a personality. Your character might not always say the thing you wanted them to say, so there is a bit of a mismatch there, but I love that you actually are a character. You're an entity in the world. You're not just this faceless, nameless thing that just agrees to everything every character in the world ever tells you to do. You actually do have thoughts, and you do get to make decisions. Decisions, largely for me, I didn't enjoy about the game, which I'll talk about later, but the, the fact that we do have a personality and we do have a role to play I do very much enjoy. Oh, also the other thing, this might seem a bit mismatched but I think it's overlooked quite often, but the personal story can be funny. There, there are certainly funny moments in it. Certain races are sl slightly more funny than others, but it can make you laugh. I mean, it really did make me laugh quite a few times and that, that's something good. That really is. And it didn't have to resort to cheap references to other things to make me laugh. It was just straight up funny, well-written wit that was in the story and uh, I really did enjoy that and I found that affecting me every now and then. So I feel like that should be mentioned 
mentioned. That was a part of the personal story. And yes, it made things more lighthearted and maybe you were looking for a more dark experience, which I know I certainly was. But still, it, it had its place and I think it worked. It wasn't, you, you know how bad, bad humour can be. They certainly didn't fall into that trap. So that was very good. Uh, aside from that, though, I think some people will say that the little dialogue cutscenes that you have where you've got you on the left and an NPC on the right were good. I think some people did enjoy those. I personally didn't enjoy those that much. I actually think that holds them back quite a lot. All we're seeing in these cutscenes are the same animations that these characters could be playing in the in-game world. Putting us in those little cutscenes I really feel like doesn't work because we have one of two things to focus on. We can read the subtitles that are above in which case why not just have it in a block of text anyway in the in-game world or we can look at how poorly that everything is lip-synced which obviously isn't necessarily a problem with the story itself but rather the amount of resources they could dedicate to lip-syncing things but it's not much choice you get there it's really not it just really I, to me brings attention to how limited a lot of the animations are I feel like the story would have been far better if we experienced all of it actually there in the game world right in front of us because then you have all the other stuff to draw focus away from these minute details that obviously they don't have millions and millions of dollars to work out at least then you've got the environment you've got other things to distract you and often I felt those little dialogue cutscenes broke the pace as well the battle on Claw Island for example you can never really drum into the pace of that mission the significant moment in the story that I think a lot of people will look back on as a highlight of the plot as it went forward that was just broken for you because you felt like you were under this awesome siege this massive attack and all of a sudden every you just been totally yanked out of it because of the cutscene having the NPCs actually just talk over your shoulder while you're playing through is far more exciting far more interesting a great example of it that they did right is in the Sorrows Embrace dungeon there's a dredge that will start speaking to his army of dredge basically and you're in the room and it doesn't put you into a cutscene you just hear it while you're in full control of your character it's a totally different experience it really does a lot for the pacing so I would very much prefer to see more of that as the game goes forward rather than those more limited cutscenes that they decided to go with through the personal story I, I find it very interesting I wonder whether they really ended up how Arena Net wanted them to because as you may all remember throughout all the betas really it had that little work in progress sign up there and people were constantly hounding them and throughout the development of the game saying are these going to improve this looks clunky this looks disjointed this doesn't look really good how are you going to improve them and there was a lot of talk about how there were going to be more animations it was all going to be synced up more but that just never really came and I feel like in a, in a way it has held the personal story back I think I would have had a much greater experience even if we had all the same dialogue all the same characters everything was exactly the same but we just never had those little dialogue things and I was fully in control of my character all the time I think I would have enjoyed it a lot more I can honestly say now the fact is that ArenaNet did use these small cutscene things to tell most of the personal story any kind of significant dialogue or anything that really happens kind of occurs through those which I think is the major problem it's been used so extensively alongside that though they have also put a few small cutscenes in there every now and then which I will say I do feel like work it always feels like a breath of fresh air whenever you do see one of these proper cutscenes where we do have the in-game universe and the camera is panning around sometimes the camera is a bit off but generally this does feel really good but again I would make the same point that I still don't like we're losing in control of our character a lot these times so the final dungeon okay I was terribly terribly disappointed in the end of the final dungeon and it's a great example of this this whole idea of losing control early on in the dungeon you're on an airship flying over Ara. it's very cinematic you have full control of your character and slowly looming out of the distance you see giants and not just normal giants but absolutely mammoth huge creatures a hundred foot tall even bigger than that it's very very impressive and a really cool sight because you suddenly realize oh god we're gonna have to fight these things by the same token at the end of the dungeon we are introduced to Zaitan the final dragon the final boss the thing we've been hearing about the entire way through the game and instead of just flying through and attacking your airship with you in full control of your character just watching him in awe as he flies around as you do with previous dragons and as you do with the giants earlier on in the mission instead we just get loaded into a cutscene and we see a few flyovers of Zaitan that really aren't that important impactful. It's really disappointing to see that they went with this. Now there are other problems the final boss fight for example has no mechanics whatsoever so I would very much recommend nobody actually plays that until ArenaNet sorts it out uh, but that's not so much about the story but this I feel like is a really good example of what I'm trying to say with don't let us lose control of the character. I think some people might find this criticism of, of, of the cutscenes and so forth to be a little bit unjustified but it really is an incredible difference if you know you're not in the safety and sanctity of a cutscene where nothing bad can truly happen 
happen. Especially ones that are too long and it definitely just feels like they're simply showing off what they've created. They're just showing off the explosion that's about to happen or the creature that we're looking at. Anyway, on to my next point. I've kind of flogged this one for a bit long. That's not really my main problem that I had with the personal story. My main one was the choices. This was a fundamental decision Arena Net made about the way they wanted their story to be told, the way they wanted to make their game early on in development that they went through with that I feel like really caused them to shoot themselves in the leg. And this is the amount of choices that they gave us as players. Now, don't get me wrong, this could sound exciting, and it does sound exciting, it did sound exciting when they were talking about the game, oh, you're going to have a choice for every 10 levels, and there's going to be all these different branches, and that sounds really, really good and compelling and interesting, and yes, they did deliver with an awful lot of choices, but I feel like they did too many choices, and actually it was pointless to go with so many. You see, they could have pulled all of their resources for the personal story into one, let, let's go to one extreme here, they could have just had one storyline, they could have had no matter what race you were, there was no choice of order, there was none of that, you could have played different races but it was always going to be the same story, and they could have had that, they could have had all their resources into this one coherent, long story that really fed you through, all the way from level 1 to level 80, it lasted a very long time, Every topic that they broached had plenty of time and effort put into it and all of the pacing was immaculately done. They could have done that and they could have given us something that ended up really cinematic and really compelling and really engaging. They could have done that, but instead they gave us lots of choices, which is a cool idea and a lot of people don't like entirely linear stories and they do like to have the odd choice here and there. But the problem is they made so many choices that they diluted that really long good cinematic experience they could have created to the point where it almost feels like you don't need to make any choices in the first place. And there's two reasons why this happened. First of all, the home instance. The original idea was you'd have different decisions to make in your personal story that would then be reflected in your personal instance, which you would have a reason to go back to and you would be reminded of those decisions you made and the consequences that came of them. Classic example that when you're a human, you would have the choice. Do you save the hospital or do you save the orphanage? And make that decision count because every Every time you return to that area, whatever building you chose not to save will be burnt down and you will see the repercussions of that. However, the problem here is that they then developed a personal story that took you miles away from the home instance. I played my Asura, honestly, I played my Asura all the way through the personal story without even really understanding which was my home instance because I was never really compelled to go back there. I went there a couple of times in the personal story. It wasn't even clear that that was a personal instance outside of any of the other instances that the personal story took place in. And I moved on. Every choice I made that could have had some impact somewhere was never made clear to me and never actually mattered because returning to that place isn't something you do on any race. You really don't do it. The option is there, but the home instance did not become what it was meant to be. There was a lot of talk originally when they were designing it about how it would be a place that you could show your friends and they would see how you chose to save the world and all of your choices and all of the characters would somehow be displayed there and it would be a cool thing thing to do but how many of you watching this video went back and did that I know I've certainly never done that it's not something you ended up being compelled to do so that was a big problem with the choices they split the storyline into all these different places but this idea of choices having consequences was immediately invalidated and in fact I think as the story went along sadly there were even less choices that had consequences in the first place as you moved geographically further away from your personal instance it happened less and less and less and now here's the other problem. Early on we had the choice do we save the hospital or the orphanage and that actually mattered. You could only save one and depending on your choice the other thing would get messed up. But let's look at some of the story that happens in ore. You have a choice to help push a load of tanks further into ore. You have a choice to help out the navy or you have a choice to assist a missing squad that seemed to have found something. Now if you take the story to go and follow the, the squad of people that have gone missing you find out that they've discovered a searing call that the Orions that Zaitan is going to use on you, that you are going to be wiped out. He's going to use the Searing Cauldron on you, and it's this terrible, terrible thing. So by 
choosing this choice, you then go forward and you capture the Searing Cauldron from yourself and in fact use it against Zaitan, which is very cool and actually one of the highlights for me of the personal story, especially when you look at it in perspective of the universe. This is what I'm talking about, the game having a great universe. The idea of a Searing going down in awe in this place that's already so messed up is really fantastic and a very compelling, cool idea. But besides that, this was the choice we made. It's established in the story that we've saved these people from a terrible fate because we found out about this cauldron of cataclysm. However, go back to the choice. What happens if we picked to go with the tanks then? Does Zaitan ever use this cauldron on us? Surely he should. Our choices have consequences, right? No. Arena Net stop honouring any of those consequences or choices we make, even when something to do with a personal instance isn't involved any longer. If you don't choose to go with the scouts, then it may as well have not existed anyway. And I think that that's a real shame. A lot of these choices you're making are superficial. It doesn't actually matter. It's just what do you think sounds slightly more cool. And this kind of goes a bit deeper and is more disappointing when you take a look at some of the bigger decisions you make that should have a big or drastic impact on the story you're experiencing but in fact they don't. The Order of Whispers, the Dermond Priory or the Vigil. Each should give you a pretty different story, right? Well, not really. They, they kind of give you the same template. It's the same story, it's just different faces, different characters, and different places on the exact same format. This was the problem, I think, with ArenaNet giving us so many choices that they just ended up using these templates that they copied and pasted the same story onto. No matter what order you pick, you're always going to meet someone that you bond with and will then sacrifice themselves in the exact same way every single time at Claw Island. So I ask, yes, it sounds cool that you can have the these choices, but if none of these choices actually are honoured or ha make any real difference, if all of them are just the same template, just slightly different, what's the point of giving us the choice in the first place? Yes, we've got different missions with slightly different mechanics, but the true extent of what could have made these choices interesting or exciting in the story is lost because there's no creativity there. If I'm with the Vigil and I choose to help out the Quaggan, it's the same as if I'm with the Order of Whispers and I choose to help the Quaggan. It's just different characters delivering the lines. So they gave us these choices, but then never truly exploited what those choices could have meant for the story. And I feel like that's a real shame. And you learn that by the time you've finished it the first time through. So when you do get these choices, there's no real thought behind it. Early on in the story, I was making decisions and I thought, oh, this is really interesting. What do I do? I was even taking screenshots of some of the more difficult decisions I had to make so I could look back on them later and think, what did I end up choosing there? But as you progress through the story, you realise it doesn't really matter. They diluted what could have been a really cool, compelling story into lots of small chunks that really are identical regardless. So they shot themselves in the leg. I don't feel like they got the full benefit out of having different choices available to us in the story. And at the same time, they never gave us one cohesive experience, which which is a real shame. Now, don't get me wrong, there are certain things I feel like choices are still doing reasonably well. There are certain characters you'll see in your personal story, like a couple of the Silvari, that you'll think, oh, who are them? And then when you play through a different personal story, that will be expanded on. And that is a very cool feeling. And I feel like the choices are at least offering that to us. But I think Arena Net overstretched themselves. I think we should have had a lot of justice done to what order we're in, for example. I mean, you pick your order and what does that actually equate to? About 10 different steps of your personal story maximum? That isn't enough time. This idea that every 10 levels we'd have another choice to make, just, it didn't work at all. And it, it kind of screwed them in two main areas. First of all, I think it stifled their creativity. I think they found it very hard to make all of these different choices feel really unique and have real consequences to all of them. And I feel like then we ended up having these these templates, these formats that they decided to put across all the stories. So in the end, they couldn't really do any justice to any of the choices we have to make because there were too many. And secondly, it felt a lot like it was stopping them really giving enough attention to certain topics. Like they were having to rush through certain things because they knew in just a couple of missions time we would have to have another choice and move on to another chapter of the story as they say. So certain paths you might take might be really interesting or really engaging but they get cut short because you can't have one of these storylines being longer than any of the others, god forbid. It all needs to be the same, it all needs to be formatted, it needs to be regular. And this is my last big point about the personal story of Guild Wars 2, and that's certain things feeling rushed. 
going back to the orders, if they'd given us 30 levels, for example, worth of order stuff before that character that you meet in your order dies, maybe that moment in the story would have affected people more. As it stood, I'd barely got to know the character I was with in the Order of Whispers when he died, and it felt a bit disjointed, in fact, to hear my character talking to him as if we were best friends and best buds and we'd spent so much time together when really it had just flown by and I hadn't really got to know anything about this character. When they died, I wasn't sad at all, and it's even harder to feel sad about it when you know it's the exact same template from going to the other orders. This happens quite a lot. Now, one thing I think people are getting wrong with Guild Wars 2 when it comes to character deaths, is towards the end, at all, there are a lot of character deaths. There, there, there certainly are. There, a lot of people die, and I feel like uh, an unfair criticism of the story it would be to say that ArenaNet failed there because we never cared about any of those characters that die at the end towards or. Well, I would say, at least for that, that actually we're not supposed to care, we're not supposed to be crying our eyes out every single time one of those characters die in awe. I think more the point there that ArenaNet were trying to tell with the story is that this, these are hard times. People die. That happens. They're trying to get across the fact that not everyone's immortal, that these NPCs are meant to be characters in the universe, and they do die, and there is some repercussions to that. There is some consequence to it. Now, that might not affect you on a personal level every time, but there is something more in just these people dying constantly, which I feel like ArenaNet did reasonably well, but the fact that so many people are turning around and saying, oh, it's laughable that they're expecting us to be upset about all these characters that die, we can't even remember the names of half the characters that die, tells me that... They didn't know whether they were coming or going. If that was the kind of story ArenaNet were trying to tell, that people die in awe, then why are we getting the really dramatic music coming through every time? And why are we getting the long, drawn-out cutscenes? They couldn't have their cake and eat it too. We can't care about every single character that dies, especially when it's one we've only known for five minutes. There were just generally a lot of things that feel like they didn't get enough time. There were a lot of threads that I feel like maybe could be brought forward in expansions, but... Why aren't we getting the exposition on them right now? There are tons of times in the personal story where you hear about some research someone's doing or some new theory someone's come up with or some artifact that someone's found and it's literally just a one mission affair and you help them do it but you never find out what we learn from it or where we go from. The, the primary example for me is the Tome of the Rubicon. That just feels like fan service to a point. We have a mission where we find the Tome and they say, oh, this will really help us in our war, in our war against Zaitan and then we never see or hear anything more of it. Why? Why don't you continue? Give us more time time to learn about the tome, see what actually happens from it. They keep throwing in these little things that just appear and then they immediately leave the plot once again, which is a shame. Some of them, I think, actually are setting up for future expansions. For example, the water orb that you find if you choose a certain choice in the personal story and then actually you use it to defend Fort Trinity. I think that probably is more reaching forward for expansion stuff. There is a little bit more detail put there. I think the idea is that that's something to do with the deep sea dragon and there are certainly a lot of overtones to the story at the moment where it's like we're using the power of some dragons against the other ones through their artifacts. I think there is a lot of that going on that they might expand on but a lot of the story is we are seeing this small thing we are saving it but then it doesn't mean anything because then it is immediately lost from the plot and it gets to the point where later on you just feel like you're completing needless tasks because actually once again there's no consequence to it so in expansions I would like ArenaNet to stop jumping from one thing to the other to the other if they were to do something with the Tome of the Rubicon once again in an expansion give us the time to read from the book give us a time to find out what people are learning from it and actually make it have some impact somewhere along the line just as the water orb did in helping us defend Fort Trinity that was good but we needed more of that. We need to find out more of what this research is doing. Another example too is being sent to the Shrine of Abaddon. This is really interesting. Oh yeah, okay, so the Risen are all going to the Shrine of Abaddon. There's something good going on here. We, we need to go and investigate. But then that's a dead end plot. That, that literally is not addressed whatsoever. You find a creature in the temple. Zaitan brings it down. You flee. And that's it. Then you just start dealing with the creature. Well, what about the temple? What were the Risen looking for? You can later then go and theorize that perhaps they were looking for magical artifacts so that they could then swallow. But there's no justice done to the plot that they suddenly introduced us to. It's just a cameo. It's just a, oh, hey, look, remember this? Abaddon's here. There's nothing deeper presented to us. And I feel like that's such a shame when they show us that these things are still there in the universe, but they don't get the exposition they need because we're constantly being rushed off onto the next thing because we have another choice 
choice that we need to make. It leaves a particularly sour taste in my mouth when we have only small glimpses of things because it feels like ArenaNet never really have the answer. We have threads and we have interesting things that we, the players, would love to know the origins on. We have mysteries in the universe, but if it does pop up in Guild Wars 2, it doesn't actually expand on the story. We usually hear that someone's researching it, but we never find out anything else. Constantly the question of something's origin is brought back up. Constantly the question of what happened before in the past. Interesting things that the devs know we the players want to find out about are never given as answers. They're just briefly mentioned and moved on. And worst of all, it often comes with a line of dialogue that says something along the lines of oh, we don't know where this is from, there is this mystery, but it doesn't matter. All that matters is we have Elder Dragons to fight. And that leaves a particularly sour taste in my mouth. It certainly makes it feel like they don't have the answers to the stories they've set up for themselves. Because if they did have the answers, yes, you can hold some of these things off, but when they're consistently doing it, and there's dead ends at every single turn, it just shows they've laid it in the universe to create the illusion of complexity in the story, when in fact they've not figured it out for themselves. And that may or may not be true, but that's the impression the game gives right now. It doesn't spend enough time on certain topics, and it frequently acts as though providing a cameo to one of these things like the Tome of Rubicon that therefore is a conclusion to its story which is, is a sad conclusion to have because it doesn't add anything. So really those were my main problems with the personal story, those were the things I felt like really let it down and the things I, I really want them to kind of work on and I, I would love to see change in the expansions. I'd like to see them move away from the we need another choice constantly every 10 minute format. I'd like to return in the expansions to a lot of the stuff that will be happening in our home instance areas. In fact I think that's probably what they're hoping to do. You can see there are a lot of threads that are being laid, a lot of stories haven't been fully concluded, Traherne's story hasn't been fully concluded. Cordicus is still out there. Foul Lane's still there. There's a lot of threads that are still going on that can be picked back up around the Black Citadel, around Divinity's Reach, around Ratasoon that kind of makes me think when we do get an expansion and we do get to continue a personal story, we'll be going back and dealing with more of our home racial stuff once again for a short while before then hopefully I would also want to see us return back to the order because for what was supposed to be such a big decision it seemed, what order you join the the amount of actual unique missions you got, as unique as you can say they can be considering they're the same template each time, really was only 10 to 20 levels or so which I feel like wasn't much. I would like to see some how the pact be split up once again. I mean, they have talked a lot about how they're on an uneasy alliance so that when we do get to continue the personal story, we spend more time with our order. I'd like to see more time focused on specific characters so we really do feel like we get to know those characters. And I would love to see far less choices put into the games, but real justice done to what those choices are. I think choices can be very good and very compelling and exciting, but if you do so many of them, it doesn't really matter what one you pick in the end. It just means you're going to get a slightly different mission. They lose a lot of what makes them so cool. So I would like to see that with the expansions. Take us back to our personal instance. Make the personal instance useful. And hopefully we'll continue to move up. I know I've been quite harsh, really, in, in this video about the personal story. But I've just tried to be frank about what I thought about it. And, and make no mistake, I have been harsh. I do have these criticisms. But I do still, as I say, at the same time, with the same breath, think it's far better than what we're finding in other MMOs, it's far better than what Guild Wars 1 gave me, and at the end of the day I became a big fan of the universe and the in-game world through Guild Wars 1. So Guild Wars 2 has in no way harmed my love of the game or the universe, it really hasn't. I can see a lot of places that I'd love for it to be improved. I see a lot of things that I just think are a shame, because obviously I, really when it comes down to it I'm just a big fan and I just want to see the story be everything that it could be, and obviously it's subjective and what other people people think the story could be is going to be different to what I think but these were just the things that I thought were slightly off about the personal story and I, I wanted to share them. I also really want to know what you guys thought. If you had the choice would you have the next expansion for Guild Wars 2 do things in the exact same way and if so why would you do it the same way and if you wanted to change it why what would you change? I think I've pretty much ranted for a very long time about what I would probably change if I could but I, I'm curious to see how other people came out of the personal story whether it was 
was more than people expected, less than what people expected. I would say at the same time, I don't think I was overhyped by the personal story and let down. Actually, I was expecting it to be quite similar to this. Looking at what Guild Wars 1 was like, this is really just very, very similar. It's got a lot of the same problems as the first game had. And to tell you the truth, as the first game went along, ArenaNet got far better. Nightfall was my favourite campaign. That was the best delivered story they did. And it was one of the later campaigns they did. I do feel like they were getting better. Eye of the North was delivered quite well also. And hopefully that means the same thing will happen for Guild Wars 2. We're not at the end of the road at the end of the day. We are only three weeks into the launch of the game. Certain things like the end of the final dungeon will be changed. It's, it's so clear to me that whatever was going on there will be changed. Some of the dialogue isn't even voice acted at this point but also with new content and expansions that come out hopefully uh, they'll just continue to refine what they've started here work out the kinks, maybe improve the dialogue cutscenes or use less of them or whatever they feel like they have to do uh, they can take a step back now and assess it for themselves and uh, see where it goes. But yeah, I'm really curious to see what you guys had to say. Thank you very much for watching this. It's been very long, very ranty. I'm sure a few people will be frothing at the mouth at this point uh, but I, I really do want to see the reaction I, I want to know what the general consensus was particularly from my audience which I feel like does have a significant number of people that are quite invested in the universe too as I was so I'd love to hear your thoughts everyone anyway thanks very much guys and I will see you next time which should be a bit more up Beat, by the way, uh, I've got a lot of thoughts on World vs. World, which I think is actually getting a lot of unnecessary criticism and people bitching about stuff that it really, it, it's unwarranted, it really is. So, anyway, thanks guys, and I'll see you later.